You're listening to the PRO Media Network. The next level in entertainment. To the Pelicans Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network for all things Pelicans. You're now listening to the Sports Cones Pelican Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network. I'm Big Q, your host, and on today's show, we'll be covering or recapping rather the 114 to 103 loss to the Sacramento Kings. Pelicans lose 114 to 103 to the Sacramento Kings. We'll be recapping that game with stats, facts, breakdown, and we'll have an interview from El Gentry. He'll chime in with his thoughts on the game. We'll also have other items, trade news, injury news, and of course predictions on an upcoming game against OKC Thunder. But without further ado, I'd like to give you a round of applause for joining us on the Pelican Post Game Report. And we'll just dive right on into it. This is podcast 143. That's 143 on this fantastic Wednesday, January the 31st, 2018. I mean, an absolutely gorgeous Wednesday, beautiful Wednesday. Get out and suck up some of those rays on this day. Uh, Anyway, that's about as all as it get as far as good good news, as far as the Pelicans uh, goes, as far as this podcast goes. Of course, there's always a sunny side or a silver streak to look for it and a gloomy cloud, a thunderstorm that this team is going through upon the injury upon one of their superstar, all-star, all-pro, I guess you could say, all-star big man, DeMarcus Cousins, Achilles injury a couple of games ago. The Pelicans now have dropped two in a row and... Uh, Oddly enough, they've lost this contest to Sacramento. This is the second time Sacramento's beaten the Pelicans in their own gym. And this was not, and this was, uh, they beat them by 11 points. And this shouldn't have happened. This really, this type of stuff should never happen in the game. The Pelicans go in there and and, and this was a game that they were supposed to have. You you couldn't get a better matchup. This team coming in with 15 and and, uh, 34 Coming into the matchup, they're pretty bad on the road. They were at the time eight and twenty on the road. You couldn't ask for a get well game, so to speak, or a confidence building game, being at the fact that you lost to Marcus and you lose to the Clippers, which was a winnable game in my estimation. The Clippers struggled around until they ultimately the Pelicans kept giving them opportunities. They caught fire and ran the Pelicans out of there. Same thing with Sacramento, although the Pelicans started off pretty decently the first half, but then the entire culmination of the rest of the game was won by Sacramento. And I mean, if you look at the statistics, every quarter from the second to the third to the fourth was won by Sacramento. They ultimately end up winning the game behind Anthony Davis's 23 points, a very somber 23 points, mind you. Very somber. Where's the energy, guys? Where's the where's the energy? Where's the fight? Where's the determination? It almost seems like, I hate to say this, to a degree that they seem like they've rolled over on their proverbial bellies and have given up to a degree. I mean, no energy, lethargic. You know, I've got to give credit to Drew Holiday. He did attack the paint and at times and then most times took stupid, took uh, unintelligent jump shots. When you could beat that guy, you had a center guy in front of you, you could have drove past him instead you take a fall away three pointer for real, dude. I mean, it's just a lot of just like I, I just don't understand. But anyway, since I don't understand what the hell's going on, let's listen to the coach because obviously he sees the team every day. Perhaps he can give us some insights on what is going on with his team. Here's LJ. Coach, just your first thoughts on tonight's game. Oh, you know, I I really thought that the uh, you know this third quarter thing is really becoming uh, you know. I don't even know the word for it, but, you know, we just, we got to find a solution to that. That's the first thing, I think. And then obviously, uh, you know, the second chance points, you know, we, it's hard to win a basketball game if you 
uh, give up 26 and you don't get any of them, you know, zero. So uh, those were the two things that stuck out. But, you know, the, the, the third quarter thing is really, really bothering me as much as anything. I'm not real sure. You know, we've talked about it. They've talked about it. We've gone out. We've changed some of the things that we're doing. We've changed. We tried to get ball movement. I, I'm not real sure why. You know, we go back. We look at the tape, and you know, I, I can't get it figured out. You know, why we seem to struggle at the start of the third quarter. Coach, you mentioned the second chance points, or a couple of other numbers that would indicate that perhaps trouble with their bigs tonight was that a, a mismatch problem with Kufus and, and Randolph. Oh, I don't know if it was a, a, a mismatch. I mean, those two guys are, I mean, especially uh, Zach, obviously. He's a really good inside player and does a, a, a lot of good things. And then Kufus just, you know, his, uh, his, his activity, you know, uh, was really good. I mean, he did some good things for him. But, uh, you know, I think we talked about it before. You know, one of the big things is the rebounding uh, part of it. We're going to, Mr. Marcus is rebounding. It's not one guy that's got to make that up. It's got to be, excuse me, it's got to be a, a team thing, you know. This guy's got to get two extra. This guy's got to get one. This guy's got to get three. You know, that's the way we have to make it up. We're not going to put it on one guy's shoulder. And we're not going to ask AD to be this guy that gets, you know, 45 and 20 every night either. You know, we're going to make sure that we're monitoring his uh, minutes. And we had him about right where we're going to have him for the rest of the season. And that's at 36. Uh, maybe a little more here and there but you know we just got to play better we got to play better we got to do a better job defensively coach in any way whether it be the third quarter situation that you and your team talked about or the fact that this week is has been tough in a lot of ways do you are you concerned about frustration causing a bit of a, a slide here well I, I you know I think anytime you, you lose a, a piece like Demarcus you know there's going to be residue from it uh, you know some kind of way we got to get over that uh, it may take a you know few games to do, uh, but we definitely have to get over that and move on. You know, it's uh, you know we're in a position right now where we're giving back a lot of things that we've accomplished in the last two or three weeks, uh, and so we've got to find a solution, and then we've got to get it turned, and then we got to move on. Last time, last time you lost these guys, you talked about the effort and all those kinds of problems. Is that the issue tonight, or did they just have execution? No, I mean, I thought we, I thought we played hard. I thought we tried like crazy. They, they executed well and uh, did some good things. And you know, it was a tough matchup with Zach. I thought Zach did, a, you know, a lot of good things as far as facing up. But I, I thought uh, Omir did a good job on him. And uh, you know, we just never really got into a flow offensively. You know, I thought we struggled and. You know, we had some tough misses, and then they came down and converted. So, uh, you know, I think you got to give credit, you know, what credit is due. And, you know, they beat us on the boards, and, uh, you know, I, that really was the kind of difference in the game. We had good shots. I mean, we shot 50%. But, uh, you know, I mean, they get 20 more shots than we do. And they get, uh, and most of those are obviously the 14 offensive rebounds that gives them second chance. You know, point. So uh, we still got some work to do. You know, we still got. Obviously, we're still adjusting to. Uh, you know, the 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 Marcus thing. But uh, you know, I still think we're a good team. I still think we're going to be okay. But uh, obviously, we got to get that done quickly. You know. Do you think the third quarter is about pace and energy, or making shots, or what do you think it is in the third? I think it's a combination of all of those. I, not not the energy part, because I think they actually we're we're actually trying and we're doing a good job. Uh, we're not making shots uh, at the start of the third quarter like we do at the start of the game. Uh, so we've, we've just got to be able to step up and do that, you know. And then uh, we've got to be a little bit more forceful defensively. We've got to get into the ball a little more and do some things. But, you know, we, we have to find an answer to that. That, that right there is the, is the thing that is the most bothersome to me right now. Can you talk a little bit about how encouraging it was, though, to see Jameer and Ian come off the bench, and they provided a lot of energy and some production for you? They did, and, and you know what, what's going to have to happen with us is that we got to have the starters play at the level that they are, and then we got to have, you know, like a Jameer and a, uh, Ian come off the bench and, you know, uh, get 20 and 10 for us. And uh, I thought Jameer's impact, you know, just uh, – uh, 
just just a little uplifting, and then we've got a we got a ride from that, you know. But uh, you know, we just got to get the third quarter thing uh, figured out. You uh, talked about the residue of losing the Marcus. Is it something where it just has to be enough time to go by for guys to get over? Is it is something need to be said in the locker room? Well, I think we've talked about it, and I thought we talked about it the first day. I mean, we said that you know we're losing a a piece, but there's been other teams that have lost really good players. You know that uh, it's taken them a, you know, a couple of games, a few games to adjust, and then, and then they go back and they play the way they think they need to to win games. And so, uh, uh, you know, Demarcus is, I mean, he's a huge personality and he's a great player. So, you know, there's a lot of things that's being missed with him. But you know, I think we'll get it all figured out. Like I said, we're not gonna. This is not really who we are. I don't think. And so what we have to do is that we have to find a way, you know, to get every back on, get everybody back on track and uh, get them to the point where our confidence is still back up. You know, I thought we were really confident. I thought, you know, we went into the Houston game knowing that we were going to win that game. And I think we've got to try to find a way to get all of that back. Is that why you went deep, uh, going deeper into the bench tonight? Maybe to, because you haven't had the practice time since the Marcus left. So maybe just try to find some matchups. Yeah, that's practice. one of the things I think. And uh, and then I think we're, we're trying to keep the energy up and go. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that we have to continue to do to run guys in and, you know, try to find the guy that's got the hot hand. I'm uh, doing great that night like Ian did tonight. But, you know, we're going to keep battling. You know, we're not, this is not, you know, one of those things where, it's not going to be this way, you know. We'll we'll find a way, and we got good guys in the locker room. We just got to get them back to thinking. Uh, That's Coach L. Gentry real chiming conference. in on his thoughts and extending interview about seven minutes long. I thought we'd play you the entire interview to get the some feel of what's the idea of what the coach see with his team based upon some of the uh, issues or topics that were raised that Elvin Gentry addressed, and then we look at the team. He did dig into the bench. Now, you can go back all the way to December to listen to the Pelican Post game report where we were, we were playing, I mean, Mar- Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins extended minutes. I mean, a- Anthony Davis averaging f- over 40 minutes a game. Now, I'm not trying to throw shade on uh, AD because I got love for AD. AD, to me, is is the best. He, he awesome. But besides that, if you look at what his record throughout his young career, he's not – been there for the entire season this does not help his chances longevity wise to play him that many minutes and you say you don't have much of a chance you have to find a way you have 12 guys 12 active guys here on this team demarcus cousins goes down there was an excellent article written by tom haberstry of the uh, bleacher report i will keep pushing that article because it raised interesting points about the overplaying of of DeMarcus Cousins what could have contributed to his injury you know to his Achilles injury all of the minutes that he's been playing the excessive minutes that he was playing during the stretches when you have reserve players to my part I I I do believe the article that he says I, I really do and uh I really do think so. You cannot play your stars that many minutes without them showing some signs of fatigue on the back end. Playing Anthony Davis 41 minutes a game is very tiresome. You have to be able to find the minute balance so Anthony Davis could be able to be more effective. So it's too late for DeMarcus Cousins. But Anthony Davis in particular, to be able to go the next half of uh, of this year to try to keep this team competitive, Losing two winnable games against two opponents that they could have they could have won and built upon. Now you go on a two game road trip, the face off against OKC, and the face off against the Minnesota Timberwolves, who have you have not been able to defeat. You have not been able to beat this team. Their building are this building. It's amazing. But let's look at some of the statistics before we go to break. Looking at some of the stats dealing with this game, I can't just uh, like Elvin Gentry said in the in the interview. They had 20 more attempts. They, it was 46 of 97. They had 20 more attempts. The Pelicans were 39 of, of 77. 20 more attempts at shots. And that was basically off of offensive rebounds and second chance points. They got over 20 second chance points on the Pelicans. You can't win that way. Not only that, but they out-rebounded the Pelicans. They beat them in the points of the paint battle by 10. I mean, it was just, he says energy. I don't. I, I disagree. 
they did not have the energy. They started the game off well, maybe the second quarter, but it all dissipated in the third. And usually when a team energy tanks, it's because they're tired. They're fatigued. So how do we fix fatigue players? We play other players who can who can carry the team. People that can score, who if you're behind, they can make the they can try to catch the lead or get close. Or they can sustain leads that your starters have built. There is that's the mix. That's the problem. Not enough role guys. And he finally started to do it this game, but only playing Sheik Diallo less than five minutes. And you haven't played Sheik Diallo, and I don't know how many games. Then you play overplay Omir Asik, 25 points. I just it's just it's just a recipe of disaster. We're gonna talk more about it on the other side of the break. We'll get into some more of this injury news, trade news. We also have the preview and prediction, and we'll finish up on the Sacramento loss. You're listening to Pelican Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network. Stay with us. Get all the latest news and updates from your New Orleans Pelicans at the Pelicans Eye View. The new and official Pelicans Daily Journal, covering everything Pelicans. Attention, everyone. Get, get breakdown on games, free agent signings, and potential moves. Unbiased opinions and straight up facts with statistical analysis from G Balance. Go to www.thesportsdaily.com forward slash Pelicans dash I dash View. I'm a Saints and Pelicans fan, so the only podcast I can get my fix is The Sports Coma with Big Q. The guy's intense, funny, and they always keep it real. Check out The Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. What's up, sports world? This Big Q from the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. Talking to you about the website, theposhlifestyle.com. That's right, poshlifestyle.com. A great website where you can get great products at great prices. They sell organic herbs, vitamins, supplements, water filters for your home, EMF and cell phone radiation protection, healing magnetics and healing crystals, personal protection devices like cell phones, stun guns, and mace spray, organic deodorants, shampoos, soaps, toothpaste, and more. They also sell 10A grade Brazilian hair. 10A music is available now. All kind of the latest down downloadable mixtapes. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to theposhlifestyle.com. That's the posh lifestyle, life spell with a Y, L Y F E style.com. Put in the sports coma for the 10% discount on your purchase. It's a win-win. So get your mind and body right with the posh lifestyle. Get ESPN or Fox. Get straight sports talk from the sports coma with Big Q and the guys. You're listening to the Pelicans Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network for all things Pelicans. Welcome back to the Pelican Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network. And we have a bit of sad news to deliver on the show uh, to you. Ex NBA player Rasul Butler and his wife were killed in a car crash out in California. Um, a very, very, very uh, tough thing. Uh, rest in peace, rest in power to Rasul Butler and his wife. It was reported that he, uh, Rasul Butler and his wife Leah LaBelle were both killed in the crash this morning. Butler was, was of course, 38 years old. LaBelle was driving in Studio City, California, about 2 a.m. when a vehicle struck a parking meter, slammed into a wall, and flipped, the report said. Now, Butler, he was a 53 overall pick out of LaSalle. By the heat back in 02, he played eight NBA seasons over, thir- over his 13. He played for eight different teams over his 13-year career. And, of course, we know and love Rasul Butler from his time as a Pelican, excuse me, as a Hornet from 2005 to 2009 uh, before the team changed its name to the Pelicans beginning in 2013. Butler, Butler played for the Spurs as early as last season, 2015-2016 season, and that is confirmed that uh, former Hornet, uh, New Orleans Hornet player Rasul Butler and his wife were killed in a car crash. So that's some very, uh, very sad news for us uh, here on the Pelican Post Game Report. So we would like to 
issue our condolences to his families and tell them, uh, and of course, Rasul Butler and his wife to rest in peace, rest in peace uh, and blessings to uh, their family moving forward. Uh, that's some tragic news right there. Um, uh, uh, very tough. Well, let's move forward uh, in the in the podcast. We were discussing the Sacramento Kings and the New Orleans Pelicans game. Of course, the Pelicans fall 114 to 103. That is their two straight, their second straight loss since losing DeMarcus Cousins to a Achilles injury. The question is, how can this team get over the hump to get better? Oh, it's not an energy situation. I didn't see energy in the second half, like I said before the break. They have to use their bench more effectively, which they did. We talk about some of the point totals coming off the bench. Andy Davis, of course, led the game with 23 points, 13 rebounds. He had six blocks. Drew Holiday was 21.6 assists in the effort. Uh, Etwan Moore struggled mightily in his game. He was three of seven, one of three from downtown, finished with just eight points. He usually averages a little bit better than that, but eight points. They could have really used his point totals tonight. Then off the bench, the Pelicans scored over 40 points off the bench, which was very, very uh, refreshing to see the the bench get involved in large part because of Ian Clark, who had 20 points. He was lightning today, nine of 10 shooting one of two from downtown for 20 points and six rebounds in the game. Then there were Darius Miller with 10 and Jameer Nelson, who finished with 10 points and eight assists in the game. Now, uh, Amir Asik and Sheik Diallo, who we've been kind of advocating for these guys to get more minutes, did play. Amir Asik played 24 minutes and scored 1.4 rebounds. He was a disaster at the free throw line, one of four uh, shooting from the free throw line. Sheik Diallo played six minutes in the game, just six minutes. Uh, he played. He scored two points and grabbed the rebound in six minutes. Of course, he picked up two fouls. That's simply by the fact that he is not playing. He, you got to get the full feel of the game. And, of course, it's a well-known, established fact. The more you play, the better you get. So, I mean, you have to give him the minutes. If not, send him to the G League. Send him to the G League. Don't let him ride away on the bench. I just don't understand the philosophy. And having reserve forwards that back up the guys that you got, that can give the guys you got minutes, even if they play 10 minutes a game, which is what I was saying, playing these guys at least 10 minutes a game should help with the fatigue that Anthony Davis or a DeMarcus Cousins would have felt. You know, instead of overplaying them at 40 minutes a game, 38 minutes, 40 minutes a game is ridiculous. You know, and, and it definitely takes away a bit from the effectiveness. But anyway, the Pelicans lose this game to the Sacramento Kings. This is the second loss to Sacramento. Let me tell you how bad Sacramento is. Sacramento is, is a terrible team. They're a terrible defensive team. They're dead last in the Pacific where they come from. They're 16 and 34, 23 games behind the Golden State Warriors. They're a pretty bad team. Bottom line. And in the NBA, it's all about matchups. Yeah, I get that. But when you have a team like Sacramento, who is the second worst team in the Western Conference, only like a, a loss ahead or a loss ahead of the, the Sacramento, the Dallas Mavericks, the Sacra King, Sacramento Kings are by far one of the worst teams in the NBA. You have to get wins against that team. That team was three. That team was two of six the last 10 games. And then you let them win in your building. I can understand you having a breakdown on a road trip to Sacramento when you lose, but not in your own building. And this is the second straight time, which means it wasn't a coincidence. It's not a pattern. So it's just asinine to me. It's just uh, completely ridiculous. Anyway, let's move forward on some news dealing with. The injury situation. Of course, you knew that the Pelicans did suffer a couple of injuries in the game. Rajon Rondo left the game after taking an elbow from Amir Asik. He was crossing underneath him to go to the opposite side of the floor. And Amir Asik didn't see him. And he stuck his arms out. And in the rest is history. Rondo, Rondo caught a elbow to the face, to the nose area. And he began to bleed all over the floor. So they had to get a towel or whatnot and clean him up. And he didn't come back in the game after that. And then it was also the fact that you had Dante Cunningham who also started, who's, who's been starting the last few games for the Pelicans Cunningham in this game played uh, 10 minutes of the game. He, he was two of three, wasn't very effective. He had four points in the game. He had left the game due to soreness in his back. And now he's day to day. So where do you go there? You go small ball with Dante Cunningham 
Do that mean that you have to play Sheik Diallo more? Or maybe start Amir Asik now and move Andy Davis back to where he belongs at the four? Perhaps. It's just one of those things that what I've been saying. This team is too guard heavy. This team is too, totally too guard heavy. They don't have enough power forwards. And it showed against a guy like Zach Randolph, who just, Zach Randolph just literally just by himself bullied these guys into submission. 26 points and 12 rebounds by the aging veteran who played 32 minutes in this game. If it wasn't for Zach Randolph contribution, where he had 12 rebounds, and you had Kusfos, who had 17 rebounds, 10 of which was offensive. Zach Randolph had nine of those. So nine offensive, excuse me, seven offensive rebounds by Kufos on the uh, the position. Three from Zach Randolph. That's 10 of the uh the 10 of the 14 offensive boards that this team had got between two players. Can't allow it to happen. The, the, the Pelicans need more girth. They need more strength. They need more bigger bodies down there. Sheik Diallo is not that big a body. He's a slender forward, slender kind of power forward, if you won't call him that. They need girthy guys, big guys that can brutalize and battle in the post. We don't have that. We're too guard heavy. And, uh, and, and it showed against Sacramento as they beat us. It, they, they, they were able to get the win. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, if we can move forward here. And uh, we don't know what it, day to day now, like I said, with the injury report dealing with Raja and Rondo. I mean, uh, Rondo, we didn't get anything on Rondo. We expect Rondo to be all right. He just took an elbow to the face. We don't know what's going on with Dante Cunningham, if he'll be able to come back and play the next games. Uh, like you said, it's day-to-day. We'll just have to keep that monitored and moving ahead. Looking at some of the trade news that occurred with the Pelicans, of course you know that the Pelicans you know, lost uh, uh, DeMarcus Cousins. If you hadn't known, uh, you've probably been in uh, hiding under a rock somewhere or you've probably been somewhere away from the world. And not know that Demarcus Cousins is on injury. The Pelicans did yesterday attempt to make a trade to bring somebody in uh, to effect, in effect, help the team out. Now, this was actually a pretty good thought to try to bring in Nikolai Meritic. Now, Meritic is a very good player. You know, I, I'm going to have to give it to him. He's an excellent player that could really help this team. He's in the mode of a stretch four type of guy. He can score. He's been scoring off the bench. He can score. He can score. He's averaging almost 17 points a game and six and a half rebounds a game. Uh, he missed 23 games this season because his teammate punched him in the face, knocked him out and fractured his face, gave him a concussion. Would he hit him with a sledgehammer? Anyway, uh, the Pelicans were not able to complete the, the deal for Nikolai Mur- Murtovich because of an option that he wanted for the 2018-2019 season. He wanted that exercised. And uh, he had the right to waive the deal. He chose to waive the deal because he wants that option. If he says, listen, if the Pelicans going to pay me my $12.5 million it, for next year, uh, 2018, uh, that option, that play option that I want, you can have me. Uh, they said, the Pelicans said, uh, no, we're not willing to do that. So that, that niche the deal. Now the Pelicans have to find somebody else to help out, and they need somebody uh, as soon as possible because I see Gentry has an absolutely no confidence or no faith, none whatsoever, in Sheik Diallo. And by mere fact that he's forced to play Amir Asik, who was included in the Merito- in the Meritix deal where they were going to send a first-round draft pick, this year's first-round draft pick, and the bad and horrible contract of Mira Isaac signed by Dale Demps. So Dale Demps traded a first round draft pick. I think it was two of them to acquire Amir Isaac from Houston, then gets him here, overpays him and now have to ship now trying to ship him out of here, trying to ship him out of here with a first round draft pick. Absolutely crazy, man. Absolutely horrible, absolutely stupid, absolutely backass, absolutely I, any word you can come up with that, I, I stick it to it. Because this is what I've been talking about for years now about Dale Demps and these stupid moves that he's been making, overpaying these guys, not building through the draft. It is more imperative and cheaper and smarter for you to build through the draft than it is to go out and overpay for free agents. We overpaid for Amir Asik. 
He makes $11 million a year and he does not play. He recently just started playing. And then you can say the argument, well, they were trying to hold on to him so they can trade him. I doubt that. When DeMarcus Cousins, before, if they would have played Amir Isaac, who makes $11 million a year, who's not a scrub, he's not totally a scrub, he's played on previous teams and he was quite effective, let him play. Give him 10 minutes a game. If I guarantee you that if they played Amir Isaac 10 minutes a game this entire season, DeMarcus Cousins would not be sitting on the injury list right now. I promise you that. I promise you that. I promise you that would be the case. Sheik Diallo, who they who they themselves drafted Sheik Diallo, and he just sits on the bench riding away. I don't get that. If he is not ready, send him to the G League. But they do not. They just sit him right there, keep him there, and then he eats up, eats up spacing, and then he finally gets the chance to play yesterday. He plays four minutes before he yanks him out. It's just amazing to me. And then they talk about, well, we have to solve the third quarter problem. The problem with the third quarter is your damn players are tired. That They don't have any energy. You have to play the guys off the bench more. And it was thank you, Gentry, for playing Mike James. Thank you. Thank you, finally, after acquiring this man. I don't know how many days ago, but it's got to be close to his 10th day for them to finally play Mike James a few minutes, and he scores two points. Golly, man, damn. Thank you. But you have to be able to rely on your bench to win these games or sustain leads or to if they're trailing to at least cut the leads for the starters to come back in. Basic common sense stuff. Now, Adel Demps must, he has to look out into and see what other deals that he can raise to bring in. Listen, man. For a long time, we've been talking about building the team the right way. You've got DeMarcus Cousins. They're going to pay DeMarcus Cousins to bring him back. Rest assured that is. You have two years left for Anthony Davis. Drew Holiday has been overpaid. He's going to make 20 something million million a year. You got $11 million to a backup center who you rarely play. Then you have another $10 million, almost $11 million to a, to Solomon Hill, who they overpaid for, who can't shoot the three. And then you have between Solomon Hill, Amir Asik, and Alexis Jinka, who don't fit the, the type of style that your coach was running. You got nearly $25, $30 million set in between those players, and now you can't afford to pick up a $12 million option on a player who averages 17 points a game for you. Amazing. But let, anyway, let's move on to the previewing of the next game that's coming up for the Pelicans, which they'll be taking on, guess who? The OKC Thunder. It can't get any harder for the Pelicans. Pelicans had an opportunity to kind of to win the Clippers game because they had that game. They let it go. At one point, they were up by 18, 19 points in that game. Let it go. Third quarter, second half collapse, whatever you want to call it. Against the San Antonio Spurs, they scored. I mean, he's in San Antonio. The Sacramento Kings. They weren't as bad. They put up 23 points, but it was not just the third quarter, Mr. Gentry. It was the second, the third, and the fourth quarter where they just teetered off the map. They just did not have enough to bring it. They just they just didn't have enough, uh, enough emotional oomph to say, we want this game like they did when they played against Houston. It's all a matter of attitude, correct? But the coach plays a major deal in this whole thing. Anyway, let's look at some of the particulars from this game going against OKC on Friday night in the, in the OKC's building. And then it's the first part of a back-to-back. The second game, of course, will be Sunday against the Minnesota Timberwolves in Minnesota, a team that they struggle with mightily. But first thing first, OKC. OKC averaging about 106 points a game. They allow teams to score 102 points a game. They shoot 45.5% from the field. They get 45 rebounds per game, 21 assists per game, 5 blocks per game, 9 steals per game. And right now they're 8-2 and two in the last 10 games, so they're playing pretty strong. They just lost, uh, well, they lost the matchup against Washington yesterday, 102-96. to The Wizards put on a, a performance to get that game, but prior to that, they were rolling on an eight-game winning streak, by the way, and the uh, Wizards just broke it. So they'll be interested in, in getting a win against the Pelicans. It, they'll be looking to get back on the right streets. They did lose a- Andrew Robertson for extended periods of time. We'll see how that affect them down the line. Looking at the Pelicans, numbers one, averaging 111 a game, giving up 110.7. Uh, their field goal percentage is 40, almost 49%, 43 rebounds per game, 26 assists per game, five blocks per game. Seven and a half steals per game on a current losing streak of two games, and they're seven and three the last 10 games. 
Pelicans dropping two. Of course, they lost to a, a dissimilar fashion. If you look at the go back and look at the games, they lost to the Clippers 112 to 103. They lose to the Sacramento Kings 114 to 103. And, uh, and, the, and the Sacramento Kings averaged less than 90 points, 98, 99 points a game, but they were able to put up 114 against the Pelicans, which speaks about their rebounding offensively. There speaks about their transitional defense. And of course, you said, well, if DeMarcus Cousins wasn't there, that's not the case. If DeMarcus Cousins is not there, Anthony Davis, Drew Holiday, and the rest of the Pelicans are good enough to beat Sacramento. Bottom line. Moving ahead, looking at the, the matchup between the Kings, this, uh, okay, uh, excuse me, OKC comes in the game at 30 and 21. Winners are in there 19 and 7 at home, so they're pretty good at home. The Pelicans dropped to 27 and 23. They're 13 and 12 away. This is going to be a difficult matchup for the Pelicans, no matter how you slice it. They got the big three. And I mean the big three of the Thunder. Now the Thunder dispatched the Pelicans. Oh, actually, the Pelicans beat the Thunder and 114 to 107 for that was a huge win. They just they didn't totally figure it out, but they were kind of uh they lost that game. Uh, 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 be able to get that game, so the the uh, the uh, Thunder will look ahead at trying to do something uh, to kind of defeat this team. You look at OKC coming into this game, and the top man, of course, is Russell West, Westbrook in the game. He's the excellent guy that they have to contend with, and Drew Holiday might spend a lot of time on him. But Russell Westbrook drew 51 games, averaging 25 points a game. He averages about nine rebounds a game. He averages 10 assists a game. The guy is awesome. Then, of course, you have a guy like Paul George, who's second behind him and scoring averaging 21. And then Carmelo Anthony is averaging 17. So you have first so you have Russell Westbrook with 25 and a half. Paul George at 36 and a half. And, excuse me, uh, uh, 25 and a half. George at 21 a game. And then Carmelo Anthony at 17, almost 18 points a game. Then you have Steven Adams, the center, at 14 a game. It's just, it, it, no. Well, I'm not picking the Pelicans to win this game. I, I just, I, I'm sorry to tell you, I just think the Pelicans is somewhere, somewhere that I don't know if they can dig themselves out. It's three superstars that's playing really well together. Two 20-point scores and a Pelican team that can't beat the Clippers, who can't beat the Sacramento Kings going to the Oklahoma City Thunders gym and trying to beat them. Uh, I think not. The Pelicans will lose this one to be third streak loss and possibly they can embark on a four-game losing streak against Minnesota. But we'll cover it more down the line. Thank you for listening to the Pelican Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network. Please donate to our show on patreon.com slash the Pro Media Network and share our show. Join our social media families at Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Peace. Get ESPN or Fox. Get straight sports talk from the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. What's up, world? This is DC from the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. Have you ever been sitting in front of your computer screen, all in traffic, tired, lacking energy, feeling drained? Did you know there are electromagnetic fields or EMF waves all around you that cause this disease? Get it? This ease. Luckily here at Posh Lifestyle, you can get your EMF protection. They have pendants, the shell dye bricks, cubes, and pyramids. Check out the PoshLifestyle.com. That's life spelled with a Y. P-O-S-H-L-Y-F-E-S-T-Y-L-E.com for all your health needs. So get your mind and body right with a Posh Lifestyle. Clear, clean, great tasting filtered water. We're all thirsty for it. But in the U.S. alone, an estimated 2.5 million plastic bottles are added to the environment each year in search of the perfect drink of water. There has to be a better solution, and there is. Crystal Quest, a leader in the manufacturing of water filtration technology, has been providing clean, drinkable water for 20 years. With a deep commitment to providing the highest quality products and excellent customer service, Crystal Quest has been recognized by such leaders as Consumers Digest, Dr. Oz, and Colin Ingram's The Water Drinking Book. Providing cost-effective, reliable water filtration systems for residential, commercial, and industrial customers worldwide. Offering our customers the cleanest and most environmental-friendly drinking water at a rating of high purity. With Crystal Quest's water filtration technology, 
you can rest assured that your water will be crystal clear. Contact our network of authorized distributors and join our thousands of satisfied customers. Just log in to theposhlifestyle.com. Once again, that is theposhlifestyle.com. You're listening to the Pelicans Post Game Report on the PRO Media Network for all things Pelicans. In today's world, children are bombarded with negativity on television, online, and at school. Our kids need to have a positive outlook on life and the world around them. I want to share with you a valuable resource you can use to bring positivity into your child's life. It's the new book, 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, a guide to positive child self-image. From author and dad, G.J. Barabino. This is a simple guide loaded with wonderful and inspirational affirmations designed to uplift young people's spirits. This positive and powerful children affirmational is chock full and loaded with wonderful inspirational sayings that will lift your child's self-image to whole new levels through the awesome power of spoken word. 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, a guide to positive child self-image from author and dad, G.J. Barabino. Available on Amazon. Order a copy for yourself, your child's teachers, or anyone you know with children. 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, a guide to positive child self-image. Order your copy today.